Okay. All right, so welcome everyone uh, to this special public lecture that we have from ISS Potsdam today. Um, I am Natalie Cook. I am a geography professor from Syracuse University, but a uh, visiting fellow at ISS uh, through, through the summer. And I have the great pleasure today of introducing my colleague, uh, also a fellow geographer, uh, Veli Pekka Tinkinen. Uh, who is a professor in Russian environmental studies at University of Helsinki's Alexandri Institute and the Finnish Center for Russian Eastern European Studies. Uh, he leads the research group on the Russian environment that consists of about a dozen researchers focusing on energy and environmental politics, energy security, and um, political power and culture in Russia. He teaches courses on all of these topics, as well as Arctic energy, environment, and sustainability issues um, at the University of Helsinki. And he's also published an excellent survey of the Russian energy politics in his 2019 book with Edgar uh, Edward Elgar. Uh, the Energy of Russia, Hydrocarbon Culture, and Climate Change. Um, Professor uh, Tinkanen is also a member of the Hansa Wissenschaftskolleg study group, Energy, Materiality, Infrastructure, Spatiality, and Power, uh, which brings together scholars from different disciplines in the US, Sweden, Finland, um, and Germany to examine the spatial and social uh, aspects of energy and energy infrastructures. Uh, he's also a really prolific media uh, commentator and sort of very, very much engaged in public policy uh, conversations and outreach. Uh, he's speaking with some Bundestag members next week, uh, just gave an interview with, with the site, uh, et cetera. And so as, as if all of these things were, were not enough, um, he's also a reserve major with the Finnish Defense Forces. And I think that that might be something of, of interest <laughs> for, for some of us as we think about the security politics um, and, and the special situation uh, and perspective that, that he can offer us from Helsinki. Uh, so with that, I will give the floor um, over and yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie, very much for the invitation, first and foremost, to, to talk about very, very topical issues. And, and um, actually it was really, uh, as, as a typical Finn, it's, it's difficult to, to uh, how to say, uh, to hear so many positive things about yourself. So, I mean, I'm kind of humbled here, but, but thank you. Um, uh, yes, certainly today's talk is, uh, we have one and a half hours and I hope we have plenty of time for, for discussion and questions. And because more, many, many things, of course, as you understand, are uh, evolving as we, we speak. Uh, so big part of my presentation actually uh, touches um, kind of just thoughts that have you know, popped in my mind during the last couple of weeks that how we should manage the situation. So it's not really based on any, any empirical long-term long research, uh, but actually I will also uh, present some of the results from the book that Natalie mentioned, The Energy of Russia, which actually was just a few weeks ago published in Finnish, uh, an updated version of that book. And actually I'm going to publish it also in Russian, which is actually a very important topic that, that we are also publishing in Russian language. And actually I will come back to that issue later on in my presentation, uh, how we should move forward in a little bit longer perspective from, from the current situation. But um, without further do I will actually try to share my screen and, and actually I hope you can you can see. Excellent. Uh, my today's talk, which is um, kind of uh, try to understand um, what Russia is doing and why why Russia is waging war in Ukraine and looking at them well from abroad. Uh, uh, social science perspective. Of course, I'm a geographer, as said, so I will look at the spatial processes uh, as well. And I've been looking at them empirically for a long time, uh, actually doing research on Russia more than 20 years, uh, uh, looking at actually how natural resources, 
special energy and political power are intertwined in Russia. So that, that perspective for sure is visible in my presentation, even if I don't explicitly uh, kind of um, underline that fact. But uh, of course, we, we, we need to kind of retune our analysis on Russia because I, I think most of the people in the West were really surprised about the violence that we saw in February. And nobody expected it. Even, even the hardcore Russia scholars in West were, were surprised. And I think that means that we need to look into the mirror, us Russia scholars, and, and to re, retune, refine at least our uh, kind of research agenda on Russia. So in that sense, my talk is also related to this new kind of New, be new beginning, if you may, uh, related to uh, how and what we should study in relation to Russia and the former uh, Russian Empire, if, if you may. Um, but um, first, um, just a few words about uh, kind of as an introduction to the things I'm going to say about the current situation and why we are there. I would argue that. Uh, these uh, geopolitical discourses that we have seen, and this is based on empirical research, not only by me, but many, many scholars um, um, in Europe, in, in America, uh, about the geopolitical discourses and how, how these um, kind of geopolitical issues have been framed in Russia, um, in the public discourse, but also in, in kind of academic, semi-academic writings uh, that are widespread in the Russian society and in Russian media, for example. Um, and of course, first and foremost, the most important kind of um, geopolitical discourse concerns the Eurasia, that Russia is an Eurasian empire, Eurasian great power. Uh, and despite the fact, if you look at Russia uh, via uh, population geography, you look at the maps where people are living and where actually what kind of country Russia is demographically uh, and, and, and kind of from a viewpoint of population geography, it is very much a European state. 90-95% of Russians live in the European part of Russia in the triangle between the Caucasus, Black Sea and, and, and Moscow, basically. Uh, but the kind of mentality is very different. And this has been uh, emphasized during the Putin's uh, era, Putin's reign, more and more the closer we come to the year 2022, that Russia is an Eurasian uh, empire and, and uh, that is central for, for Russia's future. And Russia needs to remain as a Eurasian great power. Um, the second discourse is related to the Arctic. And uh, before February, or actually you could say before 2014, when Russia actually started the war in Ukraine by occupying um, Crimea and, and Donbas area. Uh, up till that, actually Arctic, and you remember the, the, from the first decade of the 2000s, Arctic started to become more and more important in the geopolitical discourse in Russia. Russia, Russia announced these uh, territorial claims in the Arctic and, and planted this flag on the North Pole, in the bottom of the sea and so forth. And the discourse in Russia concerning Arctic has been that, okay, Arctic, Russia is an Arctic uh, great power and that is the direction where the great power can expand. So the idea of an empire that can expand was very much, uh, how to say, uh, linked to the Arctic understanding of Russian Arctic, that these territorial claims concerning the, the kind of economic zones in the Arctic was very much linked to this idea of, of an ex expansive great, great power. So that was second. And the third one is, is, is uh, uh, cosmos, that's, that's kind of spatial dimension uh, in a way that uh, it's uh, related to the idea of Russia as a high-tech economy that is able to produce uh, space technologies and Russia is able to be a space power. And that's of course uh, linked to the Cold War era, uh, kind of arms race and, and space race 
and that's the high tech part of it, but there's also this kind of spiritual dimension to it that cosmos as a geopolitical discourse, Russia is a uh, kind of conservative religious um, heartland of, of real European values. And this is actually highly important when we try to understand where we are today. When, we, when you uh, kind of put these geopolitical discourses together and try to understand how Russia and Russians understand themselves as a great power, as citizens of great power, then of course this kind of, um, especially the spiritual dimension is highly, highly important. And I will come back to that. Um, and, and actually these, these uh, three discourses are uh, um, originally, I think was, was published by Marlene Laruel from, from Washington uh, and based on, based on her research. Um, but then let's look at if, if this is the kind of uh, things we knew and we were well aware of in a sense that how, how the imperial mind of, of Russians uh, was kind of evolving and developing and also linked to Putin era, Putin's era's propaganda in the state media and so forth. These, these are the things that we knew. Um, but what we actually, uh, didn't so much understand is was the kind of colonial mindset uh, that kind of is now very much visible in Russia. Of course, uh, many scholars uh, understood the fact that Putin and his closest entourage was very much an imperialist uh, co colonial mindset prevailing there. But I think very many were surprised and are surprised that how little there is opposition uh, towards that violence that, that Russia is, uh, is causing in Ukraine at the moment. So that there was willingness, at least in a, in a quiet way that the people are not opposing in Russia, what's taking place in Ukraine. And I would argue that has very much to do with them of course, the propaganda that we've seen during the 20 years about Russia as a great power, Russia as an empire. Um, uh, but what we failed, failed to understand is the, is the, is the kind of um, the problem and, and the power of um, colonial mindset that was never dismantled after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, if you think of uh, Germany after the Second World War, there was decades of denazification basically taking place and and that uh, mindset was was slowly but steadily was kind of erased from the german german society because of kind of constant uh, reflection on, on what what took place in history but that never took place in after collapse of the soviet union and never took place in russia so the fact that now so many people in russia are uh, in favor of this war has to do with this colonial mindset that was never dismantled. And uh, for this mind uh, to understand that why countries like Ukraine or Be Belarus uh, are not possible, uh, that kind of makes it understandable because that, that kind of imperial colonial mindset was never, never critically assessed. So this readiness uh, among Russian people to take that propaganda that Putin's uh, regime has been producing, to understand that the cultural language and sovereignty of, of countries like Ukraine are not possible. Uh, and the second kind of level of that uh, colonial imperial mindset that doesn't think that um, Ukraine or Belarus can be independent countries is the fact that um, yes, Russia is an uh, authoritarian country and it's an authoritarian model to rule that empire. Um, and what has taken place in Ukraine during the last 30 years and especially during the last decade is well, all the problems included with corruption and, and, uh, and uh, role of oligarchs and so forth in Ukraine 
but still it, it's uh, it's uh, compared to Russia it is a success story when it comes to democratic institutions and their strength and their power so in that sense a democratic Ukraine is a model that is seen by not only Putin's entourage, but many people in Russia. It's, a, it's an anti-Russian model because it shows another option or would show uh, another option how, how also the Russian society could be governed. And that's the kind of reason why, why uh, Putin argues and many people in argue that, that, that Ukraine cannot, cannot exist as a independent country, uh, kind of uh, separate from, from uh, Russia. Uh, so, but the third level is, um, and that brings us to today's topic, energy and, and climate change and, and uh, materialities and, and, and spatial processes. Um, how Putin's Russia then has built this authoritarian empire uh, of course, the economic foundation by far has been based on oil and gas. This is the economic muscle that has uh, made it possible for, for Putin and his regime to invest in, in violence, violence machinery, basically. One third of Russia's state budget has gone to, uh, to military, police, security forces. And uh, the fact that Russia's economy is so so dependent on oil and gas has has uh, uh, enabled actually to invest such big sums of money into into this uh, kind of violence machinery. And in order to uh, justify this, and this is something that I will come back come back to when we look at kind of the results of my book, is that what we have seen during the last. 20 or 15 years in Russia is, is a hydrogen carbon culture in the making. So kind of backing the idea of Russia as a great power, but that as, a, as a great power that is leaning on fossil energy that actually makes Russia a stronger empire, uh, which is now visible, for example, in the fact that for Europe, it's highly problematic to get rid of dependence on Russian, Russian oil and gas. So in a sense, uh, the, the empire is stronger because of energy and because of the uh, kind of propaganda that is has been building this hydrocarbon culture in Russia. Uh, the Russian empire is is um, uh, is is stronger than than and uh, is more violent actually than than without uh, without this uh, oil and gas that makes it possible. So kind of one plus plus is is not two but three. Um, and um, if we think of, um, yeah, this is cultural kind of understanding in Russia that what, what, what Russia is striving to do in Ukraine and Belarus is, is to expand, uh, of course, the empire and its boundaries, but, but as we have heard from the Russian media, for example, that it's the Ruski Mir, it's the Russian world, what they are expanding. And um, I would argue that it's, it's um, uh, as much as it's ideological, as much as it's it's um, cultural, but also, as I said, linked to energy culture, petrol culture, hydrocarbon culture. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it's um, also uh, uh, kind of a, a new kind of iron, iron curtain that has material, of course, spatial, but also ecological uh, consequences. In a sense, the battle and the war that is going on in Ukraine, yes, it's based on uh, 19th century ge geopolitical thinking of Putin's entourage, and many Russians share it, unfortunately. But also, when it comes to the material foundations of this culture and of this war, what they're actually protecting from the Russian perspective, what they're protecting is 20th century means of production. The material is fossil energy that, that makes possible this war because that's the means that Russia has got, got is its uh, kind of economic, economic strength and affluence to, to invest in military uh, capabilities and to wage this war. 
but it's also uh, uh, this kind of fossil Ruski Mir that is trying to um, uh, trying to uh, how to say um, uh, work against at least or 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 or, or pull brakes on on political and technological modernization that is taking place in the European space. And of course, Ukraine is here in the, in the kind of focal point because that's the territories that have been lost to Russia are on the other side of that curtain where technological, political uh, modernization probably will not happen in a very long time from now on in, into the future, if you look at it. Uh, but actually, it's it's, and that's that's why this is actually uh, not battle of Russia versus Ukraine only. It's actually uh, authoritarian fossil empire having a war against liberal democratic West, especially Europe, that is aiming to become uh, in energetical, but also actually technologically. Uh, materially a very different kind of entity that is thriving and, and trying trying to uh, 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 turn itself into a, a technologically modernized area where uh, your economy is based on uh, renewable energies and and uh, climate climate action and uh, the fact that as I said yes the battle is taking place in in Donbas and in southern parts of Ukraine but what uh, this uh, kind of Fossa Ruski Mir is trying to do is, is by playing, of course, with the, with the price of energy and, and, and the uh, kind of the um, difficulty of Europe getting rid of uh, Putin's oil and gas in this moment. Actually, what what um, uh, what the battle is also, if you look at within Europe, within EU countries, is uh, the kind of battle between, uh, yes, you could say uh, far right parties and, and political actors who are more or less in favor of the fossil Ruski Mir. They are in favor of not increasing the prices of energy. They're not in favor of uh, pushing uh, climate action. They're not in favor of energy transition. And in that sense, uh, this war also is being fought kind of in every EU member state. In every EU member state, you have the populist right-wing parties, uh, at least who until February 24th, were really much in favor of basically promoting the Fossaruski Mir kind of technological uh, uh, and, and political kind of choice. So in that, in, in that sense, this is uh, um, far wider conflict and only only kind of um, military uh, conflict taking place uh, in Ukraine. But we can we can of course discuss this and then this is a very interesting topic and and um, in a way there are no kind of absolute answers to it but 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 at least some some kind of questions uh, that that how this uh, situation will evolve and what kind of also domestic kind of politics issues this this war will 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 kind of impact and, and, and have an effect on uh, but um, second I would like to talk just in, in brief the, the kind of results of my book and of course this is this is based on my research basically basically during the last decade or so so in that sense if if what I just <laughs> just said about the kind of colonial imperial mindset and how it's related to the situation. That's kind of my pondering of the situation where we are now and what we have maybe missed in relation to Russia. Uh, this, is, this is based on empirical research during the last decade or so. Um, and as I said, that uh, this Putin's um, regime's um, uh, impetus to, to produce this propaganda and this kind of narrative for the Russian society, for Russian people, to argue that Russia is an energy superpower, Russia is a, is a, is a hydrocarbon culture. Uh, that is the reason and the, the logic to do is, is that 
Putin's regime itself is highly dependent, not only economically, but also in, in, in a kind of uh, political power perspective, dependent on oil and gas. And that's, of course, everyone understands this in this situation where we are, where we are today. But um, this kind of um, propaganda has been there for, for more than 10 years in Russia to legitimize the um, economic policy, uh, social policy, environmental policy choices in Russia by arguing that Russia is a, is a, is a petrostate that should um, uh, kind of um, utilize oil and gas to become a more powerful country, not only economically, but also in geopolitical terms. And if you look at this, how this hydrocarbon, and I, I focus in my book on, on four case studies, basically, uh, how, and of course, you can find new other, other cases as well, but I focused on, on four cases, the Arctic, then this question about uh, energy as a foreign policy tool, uh, then energy as a domestic policy tool, uh, and then the climate, climate issue. Uh, and if we, if we look at the Arctic issue, how the Arctic was, as I already actually explained in my first slide, that Arctic uh, is a central geopolitical discourse in Russia, but it's also very much intertwined with the energy futures, how Putin's Russia would like to see Arctic evolving. And the narrative for Russian people has been that Arctic is, uh, as it's the direction where Russia can expand and the great power can become even bigger, but it's also the economic future of Russia because oil and gas deposits of future are located there. So Russia needs to protect those resources with military means so that other powers, China, US, Europe, cannot grab our resources. So this is the narrative that has been told to the Russian people, very kind of militaristic uh, narrative on the Arctic. Whereas, again, coming to this binary, why, why it's so binary or so diverging narrative, when you look at what, what Russia has been arguing to the international audience, it is a totally different story. It is a story that uh, the Arctic is the territory of cooperation and peace. Let's do business together, invest in Russian oil and gas businesses, uh, don't mix, uh, energy energy and, and geopolitics together. So very, very different narrative uh, uh, compared to that domestic narrative. And the same actually is, is true when it comes to the so-called energy superpower discourse. Within Russia, very much we have seen throughout the Putin years uh, a narrative that Russia is an energy superpower. Uh, Putin is the uh, Gazavi Imperator. Putin is the gas emperor. That book came out already in 2002. That tells you that how long time there has been this kind of discursive buildup of this culture in Russia to argue to, to Russians that we are omnipotent. We are so powerful that the EU cannot, the EU is on their knees because they're so dependent on our energy. And um, again, if you look at the Russian uh, official and look at Gazprom's or, or Putin's speeches to European partners, as they call, when it concerns energy trade. It is, again, the same story as with Arctic, that don't mix energy and geopolitics together. It's just business what we're doing. And kind of the situation where we are today, uh, we should have had looked into the Russian domestic discourse much, much more deeply in order to understand uh, the developments and wh why we are actually today in the situation as we are. Because if you would have understood how actually militaristic also the energy superpower discourse within Russia was, we probably would have not uh, uh, increased our energy dependence on Russia after 2014, which unfortunately was the case, especially in Germany. If in 2014, when Russia started the war in Ukraine, dependence on Russian gas was 33% or 36%. Today it's, or in February, it was 55%. So we, we, we bought the story that Gazprom and, and Putin were telling to the European direction and not listen to what was taking place and what happened inside Russia. So I think that's also the kind of take home point of this, uh, of this book at least. 
The third case is uh, energy as a kind of domestic politics tool. And uh, that's a little bit diff different, but of course it, it has to do with the uh, kind of building a kind of a nationalistic identity based on natural resources that Russia can only be a, and, and, and a great power and, and empire uh, with the help of fossil energy. And this, this story was told to the Russian people. Um, and um, of course, there, there were also other arguments that, for example, the real, real kind of real term, kind of social policy related and, and energy policy related arguments uh, in this kind of domestic uh, energy politics, for example, that Russia's gas program promoted by and built by Gazprom is eradicating energy poverty, which was of course true, but at the same time, uh, this gas program was used uh, as a tool to, to control the regions from Moscow with the help of energy flows and energy infrastructures. So in that sense, kind of uh, very much um, uh, mirrors the, the kind of um, tendencies and, and practices that what you, you have seen in the EU-Russia energy trade in a sense that energy as a, as a tool was also utilized as a power tool in, in Russian domestic politics. And this is typically not, not uh, kind of in, in discussion or understood. So in that sense, I think that that's also an interesting case to look at. And the last one is, is the climate discourse. And if you look at the uh, last 10 years or so, 12 years after 2010, uh, I'm arguing with, with, with my case that what we, what we saw in Russia is an increase of climate denialism and especially in the state controlled media, which, which of course, by far already several years was, was in the control of Putin, Putin's regime. Uh, first and foremost, there was, after 2010, there was less and less discussion on the climate topic, which is a problem in itself because it should have been discussed more because it's a trouble, pro very trouble, <laughs> problematic issue for Russia as well and will hurt Russia. The fact that climate change is, uh, for example, in the Arctic region, uh, uh, three or two times at least uh, faster uh, uh, proceeding than elsewhere in the world. Um, but uh, in addition to the, the fact that what happened after 2010 was less and less dis discussion on the climate, but also the discussion that was there in the Russian media was very much uh, leaning towards uh, kind of Trump, Trumpist uh, climate denial discourse. So, for example, this kind of the way that climate governance, global go climate governance, is a Western imperialistic project that is actually directed against Russia's uh, national identity as an as a energy superpower, energy great power. Uh, and this was again the narrative for and towards Russian people. Whereas, again, when you compare how Russia behaved and, and discussed these issues, on the, for example, in the UN context, it was very different. Russia was arguing that we are a responsible climate climate actor because we have we have we are in the Paris Agreement and so forth. So, but again, very much a binary kind of narrative what we saw there when it concerns domestic and foreign policy and foreign foreign kind of discourses. Um, and um, that's basically um, the, the the empirical part of, of, of my book. And then what, what I write here that, that if if in in Russia we have seen build up or and then construction of this petrocultural or hydrocarbon culture, um, at least up till February 24th, uh, I would say that in Europe, in the European space, which is importing most of its energy and by far biggest share of it is from Russia we have actually alienated ourselves from, from the fact that we are so highly dependent on fossil energy. And this war in Ukraine, of course, has uh, in a very <laughs> profound way changed, I would say, uh, European understanding uh, of first and foremost material flows that are entering our European space, but especially the fact that how dependent we are on, on uh, first and foremost fossil energy, but, but especially Russian, Russian fossil energy, and to what kind of uh, violence related issues actually our energy trade is, is linked to. So in that sense that 
kind of kind of wake up wake up call for for Europe. Um, and um, my my book is uh, I could say it's it's very critical in the sense that it's looking what's what's been taking place in Russia during the last decade when it concerns the intertwinement of energy and power and, and climate issues. And uh, I would argue that it tells that in Russia, most of Russians, uh, certainly Putin sees the strength of Russia via maps like this. It's the fossil energy deposits, and that's the strength of Russia. And that's those are the tools that Putin's Russia is using in domestic politics, in foreign politics, and, and so forth. And I would argue that many, many Europeans also, certainly actors like Schroeder or Finnish former Prime Minister Lipponen, who is uh, also a social democrat and, and in a similar way lobbying for Russian gas, have seen the strength of Russia. Uh, that's the fossil world. But actually, if you look at the potential that Russia has, and this is the kind of the last chapter of my book that is looking into the future, that Russia could if there was a decent regime, decent government in Russia, uh, understanding the real threats of, of where we are heading as a global community, that is the climate change, uh, Russia could play a central role in not only producing renewable energies for itself, but also to provide um, solutions for others. And of course, Russia could uh, be a central wind power, power in a sense, but also to uh, sell, for example, to international uh, markets, rare earth metals, which are needed in renewable energy industries, be it in car batteries or in wind, wind uh, windmills or in solar panels. But Russia is not doing that. And that's because of the hydrocarbon culture that Putin's regime has been building, uh, building in Russia. And it's uh, not in favor of that regime to, to lean on this world. Um, and uh, uh, what I'm arguing in my book is, is that if Russia would uh, start to develop its renewable energy sector and, and renewable energy deployment would uh, increase to that level that we see today in Europe, California, US or, or China, that will ha have also an impact uh, on the social contract in Russia in a sense that um, um, today, the societal contract is based on this, yes, on this colonial mindset, uh, but also the, the fossil energy kind of social, social contract that where um, uh, Putin, Putin's regime has managed to uh, centralize power with the help of fossil, fossil energy, while at the same time giving some, uh, some part of that affluence to the, to the Russian people, for sure but, but um, actually uh, centralizing not only political power, but also economic power in Russia. In Russia today, actually 1% of the population owns 60% of all the wealth. And that's by far because of oil and gas. Whereas if that uh, economic model would be based on renewable energy, then uh, that to maintain that kind of power structure where you can centralize power to that extent that Putin's Russia has managed to do, uh, but also to accumulate wealth only in the hands of few would be very much more difficult to do under uh, that economy that leans on renewable energies because that uh, uh, economy is infrastructurally, spatially, materially very different than fossil, fossil world because it's uh, diversified, uh, Spatially, it is it is uh, decentralized production by far, and this is just an example from the European space. That of course there are when you look at re renewable energy production, there are the sizes, or, or of course are in a way they vary. You have uh, solar panels on the individual kind of houses in, in family on a family level kind of production all the way to huge wind parks uh, uh, over the in the in the sea uh, or in in saharan saharan context where you have solar uh, centralized solar power production which resembles kind of the centralized uh, production of of oil and gas 
But what is different is that in renewable kind of the specialities vary everything between this very small scale to, to huge scale kind of. But uh, uh, when it comes to oil and gas, there is no small scale basically. Everything is, is um, more or less centralized, which helps also to build um, that kind of regime that Putin is today uh, controlling in Russia. Um, and what I actually propose in my book, and of course, this is something that looks very, very distant in this uh, time of time we're living at the moment that Russia could become a, a green giant. But of course, if you look beyond uh, Putin's regime, you look beyond the fact that in 20 years, in 30 years, Russia will be will be denazified. Russia will kind of uh, deal with its colonial past, with its empire, imperial co empire, past of the empire, and, and think in a new way and, and build its capabilities to save the world, not to destroy it as, as they are doing today. So then Russia could become a green giant in a sense. As I said, it has territory to produce renewable energies, but it also has those metals. And at least so far, Russia has also uh, cunning people uh, and educated people, for example, in the natural sciences, engineering that can make this uh, transition possible. So in that sense, it's, it's uh, Russia is no kind of banana republic in the third world where everything uh, technical has to be kind of imported. Russia can, can build up its own industry uh, in the renewable side. But what that would mean is, of course, as I said already, dealing with the uh, kind of colonial past, uh, but also to debunk this hydrocarbon culture that has been making and, and, and kind of resign from the social contract uh, that is based on oil and gas, basically what, what we have today. And that, of course, should be done within Russia, cultural, political, cultural, political, in a sense that to reassess uh, the strength of Russia. Um, but also, of course, it has, has to be done by uh, trade partners. And of course, in this situation where we're living now, of course, we had the opportunity uh, up till February 24th, um, Europe had the possibility to push Russia on this path, but we were not successful, unfortunately. But I would argue that the actually actors like China, who everybody's talking about now that Russia is um, and making new deals with India and China. Uh, I think China and India also are not um, in favor of continuing the fossil uh, economy um, till, the, till the kind of um, dawn of, um, well, far into the future, but they are also uh, in favor of, of building a global economy based on renewable energies and, and there of course the role of china for example comes into play that how we can uh, first and foremost to to kind of lure russia into this path but also to compel russia to for example produce those rare earth metals that russia has actually huge deposits of but doesn't use them yet so in that sense to help also the global level energy transition away from fossil fuels uh, yeah, and my book, the, the conclusion is that Russia that would lean on renewable energies because of the spatialities and materialities involved, uh, Russia would be much more resilient as, as a political entity, as a polity. Uh, but of course, it would be also much more sustainable. But I, I argue that actually much more peaceful because of the decentralizing, regionalizing uh, tendency of renewable energies. Of course, I don't argue that Russia would be all pacified and would never wage any wars in the future if it would lean on uh, renewable energies. But I argue that certainly uh, the, the kind of threshold to wage wars would be much more, much more uh, kind of higher and difficult for, for the future regimes because the social contract would be not based on cent centralizing oil and gas, uh, but on, on decentralized uh, kind of means of production. So in that sense, that's that's my my argument. Uh, but of course, everything I said here during the last five or ten minutes sounds very very far fetched in this situation where we are today. So um, in order to make this kind of 
for Russia to reevaluate its strengths when it comes to the future world and its geography. I think um, we, we first need to, or do I have time to do two slides? Okay, good. Uh, what, we, what we should do uh, is, of course, the focus should be now during the last during the, during the next weeks and months would be to get rid of Russian energy because that's that's the way we can compel Russia to stop the war because by by stopping um, buying Russian oil and gas we can uh, stop the kind of accumulation of Putin's war chest uh, and um, of course there are very many kind of dimensions to it. Uh, and the challenges are related to many, many kind of realms. And of course, the first one is economic in a sense, or techno-economic. Uh, one third of our energy in, in Europe comes from Russia. And it's, it's of course, we have, have, as we have learned during the last weeks, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, to get, get rid of those uh, flows, but it's not impossible. Um, and of course, different countries uh, you compare Germany to Finland, for example, the very, in very different situation, because in Germany, very big share of the um, energy mix is based on gas, whereas in Finland, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not so dependent on, on gas, despite the fact that most of gas comes from Russia. So the situations in European space are different. Um, but of course, there's also a political kind of, and, and kind of um, political and, and um, ideology related uh, kind of problems uh, uh, in, in trying to get rid of Russian energy. And, and of course, especially for Germany, it is, it is the long, long uh, kind of historical inertia, also inertia in today's perspective of the Ostpolitik that uh, the understanding in Germany, and this is of course uh, mirrored in Finland and all, I think in Italy and other countries as well, that via trade we can pacify russia or via trade we we we, we try to pacify soviet union and that was very that was very very central political ideology uh, and it's i think it's very hard to change that overnight and i think that the kind of problem for germany to step up in its <laughs> kind of policy to get rid of russian energy during the last weeks is an example of that that's how how painful actually it is to get rid of that understanding that, yes, at this point, we unfortunately, we have to stop trading with Russia because that's the only way we can actually uh, stop uh, Putin's war because it costs 20 uh, billion euros per day. And we are, we are funding that, unfortunately, with by buying Russian oil and gas. But actually, I would say that the third one, the social, which is very much to, related to the social resilience of European countries is most kind of problematic and, and central where we should focus on when we're trying to get rid of Russian energy. That of course we know that exiting Russian energy costs a lot of money. It will increase the price of energy. It will increase the price of all the goods and services in, in European societies. Um, and uh, the kind of central focus should be on, on supporting the weakest. That is uh, so that the, the people in the weakest economic situation, socioeconomic situation, wouldn't be paying the most and then proportionally not too much for the transition away from Russian energy. Because that's, uh, that's also uh, linked to, to far right populism and its, its uh, kind of popularity in Europe. If we are unable to handle this kind of social dimension, social political dimension of this transition, that's going to be very hard times for Europe as a whole, but also for independent yeah, EU member states. Um, and uh, of course, the fourth kind of level is, is moral. Moral level, we need to stop funding Putin's war machine. And uh, if we think of uh, who has benefited by by actually funding and making it possible for Putin to invest one third of its of its put budget for one third of Russia's state budget for the last twenty years or so to to this war machine, and who has benefited from it? Of course, European societies have benefited from this because it's it has been much cheaper energy 
than if we would, would have bought it from somewhere else. But actually, European energy industry has benefited hugely from this. And actually, very good point was made by, by for example, uh, that I, I think it was the CEO of the BASF uh, chemical uh, industrial giant arguing that without Russian oil and gas, we wouldn't exist, basically. That without, if that the, the fact that Russian oil and gas is so cheap makes it possible for our, our, our industries to make, remain in business. Uh, and uh, now, since we have to make these decisions in a very uh, kind of fast pace and, and, and rapidly, it uh, underlies the fact that morally, actually, the European energy industry should be one of those actors who should pay more in this situation to get us uh, from, from the dependence uh, of Russian energy. For example, after 2014, when European Parliament already argued that we should uh, divest away from Russian energy, not to increase our dependence, but the European energy industry was the, the main lobby that argued that, yes, it's the Ostpolitik, it's the trade that will uh, maintain peace in Europe, and uh, they are also responsible for, especially this last eight years policy, to increase Europe's energy dependence on Russia. And I think morally, they are also responsible for paying now for us to get rid of that energy. Um, finally, uh, then kind of uh, looking this, um, looking into the future from, from even more kind of abstract perspective from the kind of um, Western perspective, uh, liberal democratic perspective. Um, I think um, in order to not only uh, make our energy systems robust for the future, but also to increase our security uh, in the EU and in, in the West in, 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 general, in general, I think it's um, highly important that uh, we isolate Russia as I tried to argue in the, in the previous slide, but we should isolate Russia uh, in a green way, that we should uh, sanction uh, trade of fossil energy, but also production, that's also technological sanctions, that will hurt Russia's fossil energy production as much as possible. But at the same time, maybe not now, but let's say in a year or two, to open, uh, open uh, in a way, uh, the, the trade with Russia for example, concerning strategic rare earth metals, so that on a global scale, we can enhance uh, energy transition. And uh, that will benefit, of course, climate, uh, climate uh, governance and climate policy globally. But also, as I argued in my previous uh, arguments, that, that will also benefit Russia, because then in the long run, in Russia, there will be uh, renewable energy industries which will be a boon for Russia, unlike oil and gas have been. But as I said, it's not the issue of today, we should isolate Russia to the maximum uh, as long as this, this uh, violence continues. Um, the second thing is that uh, on the EU level, I think there was also already in 2014 when Russia started the war in Ukraine, uh, to, to start this or, or establish EU's energy union so that Europe would uh, speak with one voice and make kind of Europe as a one actor when it comes to energy policy and actually uh, as a one actor in foreign policy, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And the problem has been as I kind of explicit, explicitly maybe but implicitly said that it's, it's, it's the fact that the energy industry has been uh, uh, the one that has been kind of been defining and actually implementing energy security on the European level, not political institutions. So the task of new energy union should be to take that power away from the energy industry into the hands of political actors and political institutions. I think that this is important, important to, to safeguard uh, energy uh, resilience of, of Europe, but also security in broader terms. And finally, 
and this is uh, not my my own idea that how we should de de defend democracy. And this is, of course, related to how we can defend energy transition to promote it, how we can defend climate policies, because um, without without uh, liberal democracies, I think it's 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 uh, it's going to be a very hard task to to, for example, uh, fight climate change. Um, and this is actually proposed by Anne Applebaum, who is a Russia scholar and a journalist, uh, and she, uh, I think it was in New York Times, she wrote that three points that we should promote, we should stop, uh, quit tax havens so that there will be no uh, dark money, black money uh, globally, very difficult task, of course, to produce, and that kind of world, but but uh, transparent um, kind of money transfers is, is one way to protect democracy. The second one is to is to be have let's say aggressive kind of or resolute uh, dissemination of, of truthful information. And that, that means uh, for example on climate change, on energy transition, but also on, on, on liberal democratic values, not only for example uh, in Russian language, in Chinese language, uh, for the uh, kind of um, Russian people, uh, Chinese people living outside of those countries, but also directed towards uh, people within Russia. Um, and this is this is of course a kind of very big task when it comes to how how, for example, social media is going to be built uh, and 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 directed to what kind of audience is directed to in the future. Uh, but the th last one is, is, I think, important and especially related to energy world is the fact that uh, we should uh, build our future energy trade, commodity trade, natural resource trade on the basis that, that uh, democracy and sustainability should be the, the criterion, should be a central criterion when, when we do trade with third, third parties, different countries. And, and, and of course, I hope everyone understands that this is also a very hard task. If you look at, for example, the trade, oil trade globally, most of the countries that we do trade with are non-democratic, uh, do not respect human rights and, and do not respect environmental standards. But still, this is the uh, kind of task for liberal democracies to, pr to promote this, this uh, objective and, and uh, concerns also with what would uh, with the which terms uh, for example uh, the the resources related to renewable energies for example rare earth metals will be produced in the future what what kind of criteria and the standards will be will be in place in that business okay but i i think i'll stop here that's uh, already surpassed my time by far but i hope we have time for discussion <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for the talk and the yeah stimulating suggestions. So I'm I'm sure that there are plenty of questions here. So if people want to go ahead and use the raise hand function, um, I'll sort of go through the list of whoever whoever has their hand raised. Um, I also had meant originally uh, at the start to paste in the chat, which I'm doing now, um, the ISS statement on on the war. So for anybody who is is uh, interested in, in the Institute's um, position on this. So um, with that, I saw that Alex had his hand up, but it's gone down uh, again. Um, Alex, would you like to raise a question? I think Sven was before me, so uh, I guess the floor should go to Sven if, if I'm not mistaken, because I've um, seen his hand. So I mean, I'm not in a hurry, but I could. I appreciate start. that. So I was if Sven would like. I was applauding. Go ahead. He was, <laughs> he was applauding. Uh, okay, 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 so Alex, go ahead. I actually have two questions and one comment. The first comment has already been posted on the chat. Um, so basically, it says that. I mean, all the calculations with respect to the Paris agreements and Russia's commitments to the Paris agreements are very much reflecting the level of 1990. So that basically means that Russia could actually exceed its, uh, I mean, it could emit more than, uh, than you, rather than reduce 
because uh, in 1990, there were many more countries that were part of the Soviet Union and a lot of industries, heavy industries and particularly polluting industries were and are now based outside of Russia. And Russia is a far less um, industrialized country than the Soviet Union used to be. So and if we're talking about, um, you know, Paris agreements and Russia's climate commitments, I think that this could be an, an interesting point to consider. So basically by pledging to, you know, to co commit to the climate objectives of Paris, the Paris agreement, Russia could actually exceed its emissions and basically, you know, uh, emit more than uh, than it uh, than it did in the past. But I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that is necessarily that is something that is going to happen because, you know, right now there's so many sanctions posted in Russia and this uh, the industry is definitely undergoing a very harsh time. So, but in principle, I think this is an, an interesting point to consider. My question, my two questions would be the first one actually relates to Finland. That's the country you come from. And uh, I just, you know, uh, I was following the news yesterday, Poland and Bulgaria were cut off uh, the Russian gas because they refused to pay in, in rubles. And Finland was, at least as far as I know, was considering to do doing the same. So not really paying Russian rubles. And uh, uh, do you think uh, Russia will cut off gas supplies to Finland? If, if so, how long that, will last you know russia russia is the main supplier of uh, the natural gas to finland and uh, but finland is definitely less dependent because of its, its nuclear energy and uh, well because of its history as well of uh, the relationships but uh, i would i would very much appreciate your comments on that and uh, i think i will leave my second question until uh, someone else asks their questions and then i can come back thank you okay sh sh shall i answer i think it's better if i Try yeah, to if, in, if, in, in yeah if, if that's if that's fine for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're right about the Paris Agreement and, and, and the fact that uh, 1990 was, uh, in a sense, favorable for Russia when, when you think about the climate emissions. But of course, that really doesn't uh, anymore uh, kind of define the climate uh, agenda today, the, the emissions of 1990 because uh, every country should do much, much more. And, and the fact is that Russia, uh, yes, uh, Russia, Russia could um, uh, in a way produce more, more pollutants and, and pollute more if it, if it uh, wanted. But, but if, you, if you look at it uh, from the perspective that how, how other actors are, are trying to reduce their emissions, of course, uh, Russia's um, Russia's kind of um, pledge, what he has promised, is is uh, is is very much uh, uh, non <laughs> kind of uh, very. Um, uh, Russia certainly is trying not trying to do its best in in, in reducing. And I personally, I think uh, related to this, what we have seen during the last year or so, uh, one and a half years in Russia, a change in the climate discourse in Russia that there have been, for example, two buys that fled Russia, that was a uh, climate uh, kind of advisor of Putin, uh, was led, uh, kind of was, was given the possibility to develop Russia's kind of new approach to climate change during the one and a half year term from 2020 up till the war. But my, I, this is my hypothesis. I don't know. Some, some, some might might reject to that and, and not not agree. But I think that the fact that Putin and his entourage already made the plan for this war a year ago, so that it's auto, uh, sorry, spring 2021. And if you look at the climate action in Russia during the last last months uh, and approaching the um, Glasgow climate meeting uh, during, the, during the fall, Russia came up with this uh, strategy or, or promise of a strategy that Russia will also cut it, its emissions and that Russia will become uh, an actor that will take climate change seriously. My hypothesis is, and I may be wrong, is that Putin and his entourage gave the permission for these people within Russian government like Chubais to move forward with this climate agenda knowing that in February there will be war and there will be no climate agenda after that for Russia. I might be wrong, but I think this is the kind of 
very kind of painful, realis realistic approach on this issue. We'll see. We'll see how Russia will behave on this uh, front, but I am afraid we will not see climate action from Russian side during the coming years, unfortunately. Concerning the, the gas question, uh, this is uh, extremely important when it comes to and it doesn't concern only Finland, but it concerns the whole of Europe that Russia and Putin's kind of entourage, they are asking for payments of gas in, in rubles. And this is uh, actually something that the European uh, countries and the EU as a whole should not uh, allow to happen. Um, because that's, uh, that's uh, basic, basically kind of leading to a situation where um, maybe the economic impact is not that big if, if we pay, pay in rubles, but the symbolic impact uh, in Russia that how Putin's regime can utilize it, this uh, kind of victory within Russia, arguing that, okay, we are an energy superpower. We dictate the terms how European countries deal with Russia. Uh, and, and that's the reason why we, we shouldn't uh, certainly pay, uh, pay for gas in rubles. Uh, and, and actually that underlines the fact that uh, the problem that we've kind of built uh, in Europe when it comes to energy policy is that we've given, as I said, given too much power into the hands of the energy industry to decide what is good for Europe. And the fact that in the, in the independent and kind of private energy companies are not making these decisions uh, that, okay, we will pay in rubles because we want this business to continue, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, kind of uh, totally um, in opposition to what politicians are saying. And the same is happening now in Finland, that our minister who is responsible for the same things are saying, no, no, we're not paying in rubles. But then the Finnish company, Fortum, who is uh, owning Uniper, is saying, but we're doing this. So this is actually what, what, what this is doing is this is the, the divide and conquer policy of Putin's Russia that is successful. And that's why we shouldn't allow these payments in rubles. Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs> More questions, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, so Manuel? Hi, yeah, thank you. Very fascinating talk. Uh, and I do not say this every time I listen to a talk, but this one was actually very <laughs> thrilling. Um, yeah, I got two uh, quite different questions. The one is that, I mean, about the Poli when looking backwards at the, at the political mistakes that were made at the shortcomings, uh, the mainstream discourse is nowadays mostly that we should have decoupled, and you, you seem kind of to confirm this, that we should have come decoupled from uh, our economies from, from Russian fossil uh, fuels much earlier, or we should have decoupled at all and more, much more consequently. But if I look at the at this diagnostics of this 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 um, also the the self perceived um, threat they that Russia sees in itself and like like being disadvantaged by this whole uh, energy transition and so on shouldn't that decoupling and forcing them to somehow reform themselves which is in itself very unlikely given the oligarchical structure and power structure and hydrocarbon complex you described shouldn't have it have been accompanied by by something that is we could call persuasion and to help them actually uh, transition I, for instance here at the iss is a there is a uh, has been a, a project uh, called co-benefits of renewable energies uh, that, that that deals with by practically by is practically consists in persuading certain governments and actor constellation political actor constellation in certain countries like South Africa, Mexico, uh, Vietnam, and so on uh, to to convince them of the the benefits the multiple benefits an energy transition could have for them. Has something similar been even attempted? to do with Russia by somebody? I mean, you you must know. So I, I'm really curious about this because it sounds to me that this would also be, have to be a necessary component of the, of the, of, of a strategy. Uh, so this is the first, uh, the first point. Now, of course, it's very unlikely to happen now, but I'm, I'm still thinking in the, in that direction. And the other question is more, uh, uh, more concrete one about uh, climate denialism. I was very, very surprised to hear that this was uh, such a strong, um, strong element of discourse in Russia. I already ordered your article from 2018 about it, so I will read, read about it more, but maybe you can tell uh, a little bit more in detail 
uh, how uh, what kind of uh, which kind of media promoted this you said it was in the state media but is it uh, how official was this or how was this uh, by whom was this propagated exactly yeah thanks uh, i will start with the last one I, it that the 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 journals we looked at were Rasiska Gazeta and Izvestia, but also actually um, products of popular culture and also popularized science. So we tried to try, we tried to triangulate uh, via different uh, kind of uh, media media publications how this issue was. And of course, the time frame we focused was was early, uh, well, decade of the 2010, so 12, 13, 14. Um, so that's kind of historic historical <laughs> uh, kind of uh, article already but uh, of course as i said there were big changes in russia's uh, climate discourse starting from 2020 and this is uh, the thing that i was arguing that uh, i had this hypothesis uh, how how sincere that change is when we think of future uh, act climate action in russia taking into account the fact that putin and his entourage knew that War is coming already in in in, in spring 2021, um, but it was it was yeah as I said we tried to triangulate um, the the kind of media in in Russia, um, and the very good question about this help and pushing Russian towards transit uh, transition and persuading, uh, and and of course on on a discursive level of course this is something that the EU has been doing all along not only in Russia but elsewhere as well arguing arguing on the level of talk, <laughs> arguing that how good it is for everyone that we move on along the path of energy transition and what, how many boons there are for different actors. And this is, of course, the discourse we're trying to do with Russia. But the problem is that with Russia, we never had the courage to actually uh, kind of have anything more than words in, in, in kind of not economic uh, kind of carrots, uh, not a coercion to to um, to any extent actually when 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 trying to argue that why this is good and one of the uh, areas we could have actually done it is is when it when it concerns trade in oil and gas by requiring and we should have done it already in the early 2000s requiring from from russia first and foremost knowledge on what are the environmental emissions when you produce oil and gas for us Secondly, to produce uh, certificates that would uh, tackle this problem that so much oil is spilled and so much gas has been burned, so inefficient production. But it's us who are consuming, so it would be our responsibility also to promote more environmentally sound ways of producing that oil and gas. But we never, we, we never had the courage to have kind of to really push Russia on that side. We were okay, okay, you're trying, but that's it. We, we kind of talked about these issues, but we never. And, and the problem is that we were not unified as Europe. European energy companies were the deal makers with Russia. Uh, Wintershall or Finnish Nest, they are big companies in their com countries, but they are not big in comparison to Rosneft or, or, or Gazprom. So they had no leverage to argue for these issues. And that concerns also, in, in a broader terms, that, that energy transition issue that we never used. Everybody argued during the 2000s, early decades, that the EU is such a big market for Russia. Russia is so, it's there's so huge interdependence. But we never used our muscle, the, the, the kind of market muscle, in a sense that we, we could not only persuade, but also to provide carrots that, okay, if, if you do this, you can maintain our markets, but we, we, had, we have certain criteria. <laughs> But we never were able to promote this. And I think, unfortunately, and I'm sorry to say to this German audience that Russia, uh, of course, you had this Ostpolitik and the idea that through trade you can promote peace and all this. But you, actually, Putin's Russia misused this very kind of um, very good idea of interdependency in a sense that it utilized uh, this interdependency, but especially it utilized. Um, the fact that Germans after the Second World War were really kind of sorry for the historical wrongs that they did for Soviet Union, so that um, Germany 
which should have been a central actor in, in pushing these things and, and, and providing these carrots and to being tough against Russia, never were able to do it because they were feeling guilty. Okay, we cannot ask anything from Soviet Union. We cannot ask anything from Russia. Uh, and, I, and I think that's, that's kind of the, one of the central take home points if we want to kind of build a, a better and more resilient and more powerful uh, foreign policy for Europe is that, that we should be kind of boldly uh, kind of be, be proud of, of the democratic and sustainability criteria that we want to promote with our trade and not just talk about it. And I think this, this, is, this is central here. Uh, Jana, you're next on Yeah. Uh, hi, Veli Pekka. Thanks for your presentation. And I have a question and a couple of comments. So maybe a comment first on your hypothesis. I mean, in the end, I think we're all speculating here. But at least in my perception, because I've done so much research on this change in the discourse on decarbonization. And, and I mean, I really, we did this, there is this analytical tool, how often Putin mentioned climate change and related words in his speeches and how much, how many times they were mentioned in the Duma. It was very interesting to see the change in 2020. I think the interest was not false. Like it, was, it was genuine in a way that to spin the energy transition in a way that brings benefits to Russia economically. So I think that was really there. And to, in my understanding, if Russia was planning to capture Ukraine in the fast kind of action, I think it was seen that climate change will always remain kind of the channel of communication between Russia and the West. Like already in the sanctions since 2014, a lot of the channels were kind of difficult, but climate change decarbonization was, has always been seen as a potential and very promising field, which I also supported. I thought it was good if Russia and the EU cooperate on that. So that would be my take on that. But again, that's speculative. Uh, my question would be it's something that you mentioned on the slides uh, regarding the metals and the uh, critical minerals. So I understand your point that the EU should isolate Russia and like, there should be this oil and gas embargo or like uh, phasing out the dependence on Russia, but do you propose keeping this channel like this cooperation on metals kind of open or is that your opinion for the post-Putin phase? Like I didn't quite, uh, I think, fully understand this point. And that brings me to something that I have been really interested in is I think the metals industry in Russia is one of the most advanced, I mean, in terms of like adopting the green technologies, in terms of being really at the forefront of different policies. And the developments right now, are, it's so interesting. I think now, for example, in the renewable energy sector, if you say who's there, Rosatom is the only one who's really uh, can have the enough local content because like Siemens and Vestas have to leave, right? So they cannot produce that anymore, but Rosatom is there. And so, for example, in the metals industry, we see Nor Nickel is now cooperating very strongly or is starting to cooperate very strongly with Rosatom on lithium because lithium is like, it's important, you know, we know the demand will grow also in the Asian markets, but also like look at Moscow, for example, just an example. Moscow, I think has one of the biggest electric bus fleets uh, in Europe as the city department, the transport. So they need lithium also for the batteries. And also there's this idea, okay, we have to import substitute, but we also have to develop our resources. So I think it's an interesting, like, interesting kinds of developments taking place. So I'm trying to monitor that because I wouldn't say that with the sanctions, the whole ESG agenda completely closed in Russia. I think it's very, it's, it's a much more nuanced, nuanced kind of process happening. And maybe I'll write an article about it or some kind of blog post because I think it's, it's sometimes it's counterintuitive. It's, I think they're really trying to find their way. But yeah, I would be curious about your take on metals, like strategic minerals, critical minerals, what you think about it, thanks. Yeah, so if, yeah. if I can quickly, um, can we take a second question from Sai, just in the interest of time, so that we uh, that that we make sure we finish close to close to two uh, two thirty. Sure. Okay, Sai. Um, yeah, thanks, Emily. Oh, this was a very interesting. Um, a presentation. I have a two very quick question. One is that when you mentioned about energy transition, um, well, to me that I heard a lot about sustainability. Of course, this is one of the very important pillar of the energy transition. But what about national security? Um, do you think that if Russia also um, move from the fossil fuel based to um, renewable energy based um, uh, a model, the clean energy transition would also contribute to their national security because apparently that for the EU, it's uh, both uh, could um, 
could could benefit sustainability and national security. So what about on the Russia side? And the second question is that you compared um, Germany and uh, and Russia. I, I really I think it's a very interesting point. Um, so my question is that um, do do you think the reasons because that Germany is always been a part of Europe. That's um, they don't really have this confusion about their identity. So um, you know, before and and after right now. But how about Russians? Would they can they have a very clear identity? Their national, not just national, but also culture. Are they part of Europe or the part of Asia? Because I'm from the you know from China. So I one of the first time that I heard in, in Sweden when people talk, it's like Sweden is the bridge between the West and the East. I feel like the East may refer to Far East. But then I realized when they mentioned the East, they referred to Russia. So um, do you think is it one of the reasons that why it um, makes the people that are like Russians that are never really, uh, really, really reflected in their, 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 uh, their way in the past or their history is because they never really have a very clear identity about themselves. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe I'll start with the last Last question. I think that's that's uh, that's been puzzling uh, scholars who are focusing on Russia for a very long time. That uh, how we should understand Russian identity from this kind of geopolitical perspective. Is it, is it European? Is it is it uh, Eurasian or what, what it is? And and of course, the Russians themselves are not decided on that. There's a long 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 discussion about whether Russia is an European state, and that there are people and there are long tradition of, of, of scholars arguing that Russia is an European state, but also of those uh, who are argue that Russia is an Eur Eurasian state. And um, uh, this is my of course I'm not a specialist in this field, but I think that those who are arguing for the Russia being an Eurasian state are more <laughs> of those who also think of Russia as a, as an empire, think of Russia as a as a great power that that who that in a way in its kind of core <laughs> gene is to expand. So in a sense, it's it's uh, it's it's conditional. I would argue this, but there's no kind of there's no end solution for this that, that, that depends on who whom you ask in Russia. Uh, where do they belong? Where, where is their identity? It, it differs very much. Uh, concerning this uh, energy transition and, and uh, kind of from a security perspective, um, I think uh, what you're Im implying is, is that, yes, for Europe, uh, the fact that we're becoming less and less dependent on Russian fossil fuels and we're trying to uh, invest in our energy transition, we are increasing our security in a sense that we're not we're less dependent but of course renewable energies bring new dependencies so for example on these metals so in that's in that sense it's not so kind of um, uh, clear-cut issue even in the europe european side or perspective but for russia of course uh, th the thing is that uh, of course for russia uh, producing oil and gas has been the kind of easiest way to produce economic uh, surplus for, for the society. But of course, in a world where we're heading towards climate catastrophe, I don't think it's the wisest because Russia is also uh, going to suffer a lot from that climate change that we're all causing. So in that sense, from the security perspective, Russia could be a, a economically affluent country by leaning on renewable energies and the metals that, that make it possible if it wanted. But the fact that is that that Putin's regime is so dependent on oil and gas that they they really that the regime is not pushing for this transition, and that's the, that's the kind of problem. But of course, Russia could guarantee its security and its economical security based on renewables, and also, for example, maintain a enough powerful army <laughs> to to not let others to to influence Russia. But I would argue that, as I said. In my, in my argument is that, that Russia that would lean on renewable energy would be more peaceful actor and that's not, not um, kind of the societal contract would be a very, very different kind than, than in today's petroculture, hydrocarbon culture world. Um, concerning um, the question on, on, on the kind of metals uh, industry and, and the sanctions and, uh, and of course this is, this is just me thinking out loud in a sense concerning the, the, the sanctions that um, certainly we, we should in this uh, moment and, and in the next months, we should focus our effort in, in, 
trying to uh, sanction Russian economy as much as possible. And we shouldn't uh, kind of keep any doors open during the next weeks or months. We should focus our efforts to, to close Russian economy so that it wouldn't have money to wage this war. But uh, Jana, your question about um, anyway, when we start to, of course, that day will come. When we start to do business with Russia, I think we should, that would be, should be the first industry that would, would should be the first commodities with which we do business with Russia. And we should keep and maintain those sections uh, uh, and not take them away, even if we have peace in, in Ukraine or whatever the situation. I think that's, that's in favor uh, of the liberal world, that's in favor of Europe, that we do not let Russia to become or maintain its kind of fossil worldview. Even, uh, even in the situation when we have some kind of peace agreement in Ukraine. So I think that's, that's kind of in, in a longer, longer perspective that, that, that certainly uh, we should kind of allow Russia to start uh, in a new world, hopefully in a, with, a, with a new, more peaceful regime to start its uh, kind of business with the, with the world uh, via these commodities that are needed in the energy transition. Well, that was perfectly timed <laughs> to to end exactly at two thirty. Uh, so please, everyone, join me in and thanking Velipeka for joining us today. So virtually, clap or <laughs> uh, however, however you wish to to express your thanks. Um, and really, I I 